Good evening and welcome to you in Radio Land at home and abroad on Facebook and all your networks and platforms. We acknowledge you on the several other online streaming platforms. This is the Global View on Q. It's Tuesday, 13 July, and it's just about eight minutes after eight o'clock in the studios at Q95, the big station. It is the 27th Tuesday of 2021, and I'm your host, Sheridan Gregoire. But I'm in great company. You've distinguished guests like Dr. Irving Andre, and you know he's the man we always go to first to open the batting. So we look forward to, to great stuff from him tonight. We also have with us Dr. Andre is in Canada. Uh, we have Alvin Thomas. He's, he's in Georgia in the United States. He absolutely no, needs no introduction to Dominica and to the Caribbean. And also we have with us our distinguished attorney, Gabriel Christian, who's in Washington, D.C. area in the United States. So tonight we, we examine the way forward for Dominica after looking into the rearview mirror on the lessons that we should have learned from the Patrick John era, the Haiti experience up to the very recent end of the era of Haitian President Jovenel Moise and the ominous trends that appear to be now geared at nolly processing Dominica's democracy. One question is, of course, what can Dominicans and friends of Dominica at home and abroad do to help reverse this worrisome trend? Yes, and um, can we look to a paradigm shift to sustainable development planning and international competitiveness driven by an enabling economic policies that engage our domestic economic agenda with foreign affairs based on our permanent domestic interests that foster the growth of our local enterprise, the skill sets, the cultural endowments that we have, and the revitalization of our spirit of graciousness, of love, of peace, of prosperity, and unity. And I like tonight to talk about the word unity for Kalinago and Afro-Caribbean people. Can we pursue these, uh, these progressive initiatives that we bring that will, in fact, bring national unity and the investments that we need so much and the employment and the foreign earnings and the wealth that we do need to our Dominicans. Instead of attempting to, as we say, nolly pros our young democracy, why would we want to do that? We're live on Facebook, Vice QFM and Q95 FM radio. Join the Q family, like our page, share our page, get the latest breaking local, regional and international news and happenings. The big issues remain as we speak, misdirected and misguided foreign policies, justice being delayed and justice being denied, conduct that damages our international image, lack of planned domestic economic or cultural interests, a questionable diminishing mono foreign earnings passport peddling economy, and weak financial management that translates into extensive waste of resources. We are now at the critical crossroad and where we must choose to stand united and make modern electoral reforms and campaign finance reforms, plan for real sustainable development that values environmental preservation and proper natural resource use and management. So we look to be assisted tonight by Dr. Irving Andre, Mr. Alvin Thomas and Attorney Gabriel Christian in pointing the way forward following the removal of these obstacles in the way of our progress, putting COVID-19 behind us and opening the door to a new democratic dispensation. So here's another question. Are we on the verge of a new cultural and economic reawakening? Is this a time to rise together to the challenge of protecting and sustaining our democracy? Are we ready to fortify ourselves with the armor of information, preparation and organization? We are delighted, of course, that Dr. Andre and Alvin Thomas and Gabriel Christian are with us tonight to discuss these issues. We'll discuss the good, the bad, the ugly, the dangerous, and I'm sure that they will make some recommendations for the way forward. And we'll do all of this with no anger, no malice, no personal attacks, no vilification, no divisiveness, just bringing back unity, civility, a caring society, and of course, good governance, which we, we crave for so much at this time. We continue to recognize the imperative to eliminate poverty, stop corruption, to generate real income, 
high living standards, a better quality of life and health, as we said before, just without, without delays and resilience and sustainability of our Calf Kalinago and Afro Caribbean people. So wherever you are in the region and globally, join the conversation. Tune in to this space, get your answers to your questions, and have your say like you do every Tuesday with me, Mr. G, on the Global View on Q, only on Q95, the big station. So don't go anywhere, keep it locked right here. But let us continue to also remind ourselves that Dominica still has too much widespread poverty, too much mendicancy, too much unemployment and insufficient jobs, too much abuse of women and children and the elderly, inadequate housing, increasing brutal crimes, a struggling economy, insufficient affordable housing and health insurance and health care. None of this is eliminating poverty. None of it is eliminating unemployment. None of it is generating optimal wealth for Dominicans. None of it is eliminating this lingering mendicancy and dependency on handouts, helping our people to maintain good health and, and become wealthy enough through a good sustainable job or through their own enterprise by utilizing and adding value, natural and human resources. Enable our people to take care of themselves and their families by ensuring better quality of life and better living standards. We still have a minimum wage of four and four dollars and five cents. We now hear talk of increasing that to seven dollars, but at the same time attempting to legislate public officer salaries to about one percent increase and potentially sidelining the same public officers' unions. So, as usual, we discuss. We recommend you decide what you think about the information that we disseminate. And we say a heartfelt thank you to our healthcare providers and frontline workers in this continuing dreaded COVID-19 situation. So please follow the guidelines and protocols. We say stay safe and stay alive. So we shout out all of you, our Q family listeners at home and abroad. Happy to have you with us tonight. So wherever you are in your neck of the woods in Dominica, in the region, and in the global community, our engineer Sherwin Norris. As usual, is keeping us on the air. And Lambert Lambie Charles, as Ozzy Lewis says, the inimitable Lambert Charles is on the console at Q95, directing the traffic. He will take your call somewhere about maybe nine o'clock tonight. So let's get started. And as usual, I go to our learned Dr. Irvin Andre to make his opening remarks. I give him about ten minutes, like I'll give everybody else, just about ten minutes or so to make the first opening salvo, and everybody else would get ten minutes to make their opening remarks and get the ball rolling and so contribute to the conversation. And I also look forward to Tony Gabriel Christian and, and Alvin Thomas following with their own 10 to 12 minute presentations. And obviously we hope to have some clear recommendations as to the way forward out of our current dilemma. And we will take your calls, just as I said, about 9.45, about uh, 8.45 to 9, after the first round of presentations by panelists. So Dr. Raving Andre, we now turn to you to get us going, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. G. Uh, let me uh, say uh, a warm welcome to my fellow panelists, Mr. Alvin, and uh, also Mr. Gebu, and uh, Brother um, Lambi, and Brother Showen. Uh, let me say good evening to all your listeners. I hope they are all safe. I hope they received their vaccines. And I hope those who believe in various reasons why this is nothing but a conspiracy i hope they look at the evidence and they make the right decision with respect to their own health but only the health of their closed ones uh this is a significant uh, time in our history in fact as we uh, address this uh, issue regarding governance and the rule of law um in a sense this is a tale of three leaders it's a tale of uh, the uh, the demise of Juvenile Moise in Haiti. It's a tale of the recent death of uh, Prime Minister John. And obviously, it's a tale of God as not in a celestial being, but the government of Dominic. Um, Haiti is a special case. Haiti points to us and shows to us the perils of governance, the perils of a certain type of governance. Haiti obviously has had a very difficult history. They became independent in 1804 after a rather difficult and a long struggle for independence. They defeated a number of European powers. In 1925, 1825, the, the French recognized Haiti as an independent nation. 
but not before exacting a 90 million franc bounty on the Haitians. The U.S. followed suit in 1862. In 1915, the Haitian leader was assassinated and the U.S. basically moved in. And they also exacted their pound of flesh on Haiti. And since then, Haiti has been governed by a series of leaders who can, all, who can only be described as autobot, autocratic, despotic. They developed their own oligarchy. In 1957, you had the infamous Papa Doc, a doctor to boot. And he established, or he took the whole reign of terror to a new level, a next level, establishing his own Toto Makut. And when he was driven out of power, his son, well, his son was there to take over. And his son, his son was driven out of power, if I recall correctly, on about 986. And since then, he, he has struggled and desperately to achieve a modicum of democracy in his country. Uh, a brief interlude, a brief break in this autocratic tradition was Jean-Paul Aristide, uh, a Catholic uh, priest. And to a significant degree, his demise was orchestrated and engineered by the United States. And then you had the, the military taking over. And then you had a populist leader, Kompa, hero in Haiti. What's his name? Martelli who became leader, abled and supported by the Haitian military, I should say. And then following him was this fellow Moise, who was handpicked by Martelli. Sweet Mickey, nothing sweet about him, I'll tell you. Moise was supposed to have stepped down from office in February, 2021. He did not. The reins of power were too sweet. The fruits. Two billion dollars in Venice in aid from Venezuela disappeared. The country became ravaged by gangs, vigilante gangs, spreading terror throughout the country of Haiti. With the result that a few weeks ago he met his end, a violent end to boot. And that speaks volumes as to the perils which lie before us in the Haiti. We've had our share of difficulties. I think Arthi Mate put it best a few couple of days ago when he talked in terms of Patrick John that he made a few awful mistakes in the late 70s. But there are valuable lessons we can learn from him. Many people lament that his history, the history of John, will be pockmarked by the attempted invasion, by the attempted coup. Ku Klux Klan and so on. Many people lament the difficulty of that situation. But I think Shakespeare, in his usual inimitable fashion, put it best in Julius Caesar when Mark Anthony said, The evil that men do live after them, the good will be interred or is oft interred with their bones. But there is some good that we should excavate, or we should exhume as it relates to the gentleman, the prime minister who ushered in political independence to Dominica. Following his demise in 1980, the Dominica Freedom Party took reins of power for 15 years. At the end of it, on about in the 90s, Virginia Child started showing that she was not immune to the treachery of uh, longevity in office. She tried to handpick uh, Allen from Tatan to succeed uh, over persons such as Sir Brian, then a member of her cabinet and others. Many persons felt that she selected Arlene Cabot because she could continue to exert her influence over him. Suffice it to say he drowned rather mysteriously, many people say. And suffice it to say in 1996, after the Freedom Party lost the elections in 95 and the United UWP took over, Sir Brian gravitated towards the bench. Patrick John, as you know, contested the elections in 1995. 
But in 1996, he supported lawyer Julian Prevost when he sought the vacant seat left by Sir Brian. And thenceforth, Patrick John remained a stalwart supporter of the UWP. Why is that significant? Because it illuminates at least one redemptive aspect of the character of this man. We can understand it now, probably more than we could understand it in the 90s. Because in 2000, the UWP was defeated, the Labour Party came into power. We all know what happened to Rosie, poor fellow. There are still issues as to how he died. I have my own views. I respect those of others. But the fact of the matter is, by the time of his death on October 1st, 2000, some of the loyal comrades had turned against him. They were snapping at his heels, traveling too much, and so on. They were conspiring. And that is documented. And then he was succeeded following his death by Pierre Charles, and then Pierre Charles died, and obviously Prime Minister Scary took over. There was a sense of exuberance, exhilaration, energy, youthful energy being brought to the fore. But in the last two decades, we've had a consistent and persistent evisceration of the instruments of good governance in Dominica. We've had the emergence of a certain type of species in Dominica we never knew. A new animal species. The rise of the Dominican oligarch. An oligarch which has shown an insatiable appetite for self-aggrandizement. And here's the significance of Dominica's first prime minister. He understood as many persons without the moral fiber of John or others, that all he had to sing is Alleluia, Alleluia. All he had to sing is how great the art. And his financial situation would have been ameliorated. He would have had faced no hardships. But he maintained his beliefs, his core beliefs, to the very end. And he did so, he sacrificed his own emotional, financial, familial well-being to maintain his steadfast adherence to his values. And that is the lesson which confronts us today. Do we have the moral fiber which he manifested, irrespective of the mistakes he had made while in power? And in fact, again, his passage evokes another Shakespearean expression relating to one of his kings, which he talked about in, I think, Richard II. And uh, it is described as graceless in power, but gracious in poverty. And that is the character of the man. But we can appreciate it much better now with the passage of time, with what we've had to experience in terms of good governance and the respect of and the rule of law, we can appreciate those values much more. And today, with the demise of Moise, we can see what awaits us if we continue this path. Dominican writers have been well ahead of our politicians and other servants in terms of understanding this reality. We back in the 1970s, people like Max Sylvester, Arundel Thomas, and I know we know him for his recent poem, If Dominica Could Talk, and a host of others. They have preached the perils. If we don't govern ourselves in a fashion which reflects a concern for the welfare and well being of our people, they have written about this. But unfortunately, not many of us are listening. But we have a concrete evidence. And a tragic end to this fellow Moise, who quite frankly was so caught up with the reins of power that he refused to step down and instead started building a paratory military state to perpetuate his rule. 
is that the fit that 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 we would like for Dalrita? That is my contribution. And, and thank you so much for that opening salvo there, Dr. Irving Andre. And uh, I think you, you you really positioned this thing very well. You you created that launching pad for us to sort of take off in this conversation. I, I will be going over to Attorney Gabriel Christian uh, right now, but I wanted to just say that the three things that you mentioned here, which, which made a serious impact on me, you, you did mention the question of the, in terms of Haiti, the, the autocracy or autocratic kind of leader, the, the despotic leader, the, and the oligarch. Those three words made it, because it seems to me that we don't want Dominica to go in that direction, but are we going in that direction? Do we see us going in that direction? Can we see it happening? Do we see any trends that indicate that we could be? And then, of course, you you you, you spoke about the Patrick John era. Of course, a lot of people misunderstood him. He made his mistakes, but he's human, and it showed that he was human right to the end. And the fact that you brought out this part of his character, his moral fiber, yes, he could have done like many other people, as you said, and I've said, okay, look, I, I, I love you 100%. I bought your feet. I kissed the ring. And he would have been financially sound. I mean, we would not have heard Desri complaining over the years how, how in fact, things were being treated. Their house was broken after the storm and nobody fixed those. Everybody looking at having their big house and so on. But Desri and Patrick John, our first prime minister, our first lady, they had to be struggling under those conditions. So it is very good that you brought up those things. and. It is, it is very easy to lose sight of the man's moral fiber because he could have said, you know something, let me just ingratiate myself and let me become wealthy and live a, a very good life, right? An opulent life. He chose not to do that. Instead, he supported the opposition. So I think, um, I think, Gabo, these are, are good lessons for us to learn. And then when we heard Dr. Andre speak about this, the whole question of creating this paramilitary state we know of the Grenada situation, we know of Tonto Makut, we know of Gary Harris, Gary, Gary, Gary's thing and so on. Do we see the same thing happening in our own nature island, Dominica? Do we see any trends that indicate that we may be going there? We hear lately on all of these allegations of, of this gentleman who's an of Indian extract, who has Antiguan Barbuda citizenship through the CBI program. We heard he was kidnapped. We don't know if that is correct. We don't have all of the facts yet. But we hear about him being kidnapped and we hear him being caught between two countries, Antigua and Dominica. And um, all kinds of things have been happening. This man came in, they say he came in illegally. And yet the people who brought him in, nobody touched them. They're still loose. Nobody's asking them any questions as far as we know. But now after all these machinations in the court, we're now being told that he will be leaving to go to Antigua tomorrow to seek medical attention. And that he may have to come back to them. Because I'm not sure I understand all of this. And Dr. Andre and, and Gebu, you can probably help me with some of that. Because if the man is an Antiguan, he's facing court action there. In fact, they, they have him in court trying to extradite him to India. And yet he's in Dominica facing charges of illegal entry. We're sending him back to Antigua for medical attention. Although we have our state of the art hospital in Dominica. I don't know why we can't give him that attention there. But in fact, we're sending him back to Antigua. And I heard the Antigua Prime Minister say, I don't want this man back, although he's my citizen. I gave him a, a passport, but I don't want him back in my country. Uh, Gabriel Christian, you might be able to deconfuse my mind on some of those things. Let me go over to you, Gabriel. Now you, you want to turn on your mic so that uh, we can all hear you. A pleasant good evening to you, Brother Sheridan. Pleasant good evening. good evening to you, Brother Irving, Brother Alvin, uh, radio engineer, Brother Sherwin Norris, and uh, radio technician, Brother Lambert Charles, and to the good citizens of Dominica and our diaspora. Again, a pleasant good evening. It is a noble facet of our culture that when someone dies, we extend condolences more so where that person's life in a sense was inextricably tied up with that of my family which was a labor party family let's put it that way and so to desiree john the wife of the deceased prime minister 
Patrick John, former prime minister, to his first child who I grew up with in Didi Lane, he was in Shillingford's Crescent, Renwick, Renwick John, to his children who I taught at the Dominican Grammar School at a time when Labour Party supporters were under severe attack, including myself. I lost a scholarship as a result of that. We extend our condolences at his passing. Women Andrew and I have had occasion as persons who sought to be witnesses to history and for purposes of the authenticity of the historical record. We've had occasion to objectively, as is humanly possible, note the life of Patrick John. And when we say note the life of Patrick John, we did not do so from afar. We did so from close up and direct. I was just sharing with someone the other day that in 1974, as a cadet in the cadet band, I attended a camp at La Plaine, at the end of which Patrick John presided. They brought the cadet band with the special service unit of the, Dom the Royal Dominican Police Force and the Dominican Defense Force, because on Sunday after church would be the ones providing musical accompaniment. And on, we left Roseau on the public works dumper, or a, a convoy of public works dumpers, and we camped at the La Plaine police station I will name some names of the famous attendees at that camp. Major Twistleton Bertrand, who died December 7th, 2019, the last of the World War II generation of those who served in the British Army. Inspector Scary James, who was shot in a night exercise mistakenly by Lennox Ray, and who died at University Hospital, Mona, Jamaica. Sergeant Major Ashton Benjamin, who was shot and killed in the mopping up operation after the attempted coup d'etat of December 18th, 1981. Couple Howell Piper, who was shot and killed by Winston Filbert at the state prison, where he sought to open the gates to release Captain Malcolm Reed and Patrick John from incarceration. I believe Dennis Joseph was also in there as well. Corporal Peter Fred Regis, who was killed in the Battle of Fort Fig. And then Captain Frederick Newton, who was hung in 1986 for his participation in the attempted coup d'etat. I say this because here I was, a young man at the grammar school, camping, and I was given a 303 rifle to five rounds because we were made to do in the sentry duty that night. And one Malcolm Reed, then a lieutenant, came back unexpectedly. I knew it was him because I drilled with Malcolm Reed and the same parades and so on as a cadet. And I said what I had to say as a matter of course, that that is halt, password, who goes? And Malcolm Reed brushed past me, a young cadet, in the most brusque way and said, F off. I wouldn't, of course, say the whole thing, but you know what I mean. That is what I wanted to share to give the tenor of the personages with whom I was uh, close to, had the proximity to, at the height of the so-called Dread War. A war which was occasioned when Patrick John passed the notorious, undesirable and prohibited Societies Act, also known as the Dread Act. Patrick John went on to win a landslide victory in 1975 and went on to do many good things. The National Commercial Development Bank, the Buffet State Housing Scheme, the initiation of the Social Security Scheme, the River Estate Housing Estate, and most importantly, for purposes of nationalism, purpose, and indigenous development, the bi-local campaign, in which he had the support of two gentlemen, one by the name of Norris Prevost and the other by the name of Sheridan Gregoire, when they held a very a successful and massive fair. I believe it was on the grounds, Sheridan, you may correct me if I'm wrong, of the St. Martin School in Roseau, up yep. uh, the Constitution Hill. So that was a Patrick John that was moving in a direction of national development, national purpose, and so on. By the way, nobody accused him ever of ostentatious living. And by that, I mean, no one accused him of being an oligarch, that he'd used his office for simply a privileged few and was living high on the hog. Sadly, Patrick John, towards the end of 1978, 
towards the end of 1977, fired Ferdinand Parlo and Mike Douglas and said there was a communist plot. He brought us into independence, and for that he'll be always remembered. But shortly after independence, associated with South Africa, through his villainous Attorney General Leo I. Austin to do a deal. And then with Don Pearson of Texas to give away 45 acres, 45, 45 square miles, I'm sorry, of the north of the island through the infamous Freeport deal. We spoke to Don Pearson at grammar school. I organized a meeting. We ran him away because he was saying to us as young students that we would have to enter Marigot and Portsmouth and Wesley with a permit. And this was Patrick John of the Labour Party, a party that had lost, it, lost its way, a man who had done great good and who on the evening of May 28th, 1979, as a son of Labour Party parents and of this, the nephew of H.L. Christian, Deputy Prime Minister, I sat with Patrick John and about 80 to 100 Labour rights at the six, standard six of the Goodwill Junior High School, next to Zafana, where Patrick John threatened that on the morrow, if folks came to the ministry, he would show them what was coming and he would make sure that the two bills that he sought to pass would, would be passed. One, the bill to restrict strikes by trade unions. The second, to restrict the free press. And when I left that meeting, I said nothing. I went to Lagon where there were about in excess of 5,000 people with Louis Benoit and Charles Severin and Rosie Douglas saying that the people would be at the House of Assembly that is on Kennedy Avenue to prevent the bill from passing. Patrick John had an opportunity to have canceled the event, but he sought to proceed with the event. The defense force came in after the police were unable to restrain the crowd. Tear gas was fired. The crowd responded with stones, including myself and other children of labor rights, and the son of Patrick John's gardener, <clears throat> Philip Timothy, Timothy, was shot and killed. The son of Patrick John's gardener. I share this for the young Dominicans because Patrick John had a great deal of good that we must always honor and remember fondly. And all human life is precious, including his own and those who lost their lives, some of whose names I gave. In acts of violence, some of which were perpetrated by anti-state actors, and some of which was perpetrated by state actors. And while I believe that that life has taught us, as we reflect on his passing, and we seek to remember that the, that good which he did, is that we must also take uh, from the bad things, from the errors of his time in office, that which can guide us to a, towards a better dispensation, that which can guide future governments, and I, there are three things I draw from that. One, be mindful of your associates. Patrick John had bad associates, like uh, Leo I. Austin, who gave him bad advice. Beware of the, 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 the layer of power. You can sometimes lose yourself. And Patrick John was born in Roseau, born in Pong, right where the financial center is, could not hold a meeting in Roseau. He had lost his link to the base of the Labour Party, and that is why he was replaced and overthrown, I can say. And I'm hoping that the Labour Party in power today can really take the best from Patrick John's book, which was trying to step, stand up local business, trying to stand up local banks. I believe in housing, trying to give uh, ownership and title to folk who uh, were building some of their homes with Kudme, which is community self-help. Some of those houses were built with community self-help. They were not gifts. They were not given just to people because they supported the Labour Party. They were given to people primarily because of need. And we have a situation in Normandy where now, unlike Patrick John, who was, despite his mistakes, a man of humble uh, uh, manifestation, did not uh, seemed to leave or tried to leave and a palace on any hill. He lived with the degree of humility. We see today an oligarchy, a wealthy few ruling this country of Dominica, our country, with scant regard to rule of law, with scant regard to transparency and accountability in the public interest. 
engaged in scandals like the Choksi matter, where it is clear from the evidence I have been able to discern, was taken from Antigua by force with the Indian uh, government aircraft waiting in the wings. Why? How did they know to come to Dominica? Uh, because a, a gentleman somehow decided to, to flee Antigua. Were they waiting for him because he had made arrangements with them? Or was it, on the other hand, the case that they made arrangements with the powers that be in Dominica to nab him and take him away before the courts could get into business? Uh, this, uh, this is the kind of thing that's going on in Dominica. It does bode well for democracy. And furthermore, and finally, when the issue came up recently after the Caribbean Court of Justice said that summons ought to be served and the case ought to be proceeded with, our director of public prosecution decided to nolly-pross the case, allegedly because of the absence of evidence. I said in a statement made on Q95 that Ray Charles or Jimmy, or not Jimmy, Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder with double dark shades could have seen McLaughlin and certainly the most deaf Dominican would have heard his songs of praise of the Prime Minister and his Labour Party supporters facing an election in December 2014. He was not Santa Claus. He did not come to bring the three wise men with him. In fact, he came to pervert the cause of electoral justice by engaging in a practice of treating. That is, our electoral laws state that you should not provide anything of value to electors, to include entertainment. And that certainly was entertainment. And why we did not have justice where a defense attorney could cross-examine a prosecution's witness and the prosecutor could cross-examine the defendant and ask questions such as, when was McLaughlin hired? By whom was he hired? How much was he paid? Why was he brought to Dominica conveniently at December 2014 on the eve of an election? All of those things which would have educated our public as to the treating that has been endemic in three election cycles, all those questions, Brother Sheridan, Brother Irving, Brother Alvin, remain mm -hmm. unanswered because justice was not only delayed, because we're talking the case came about shortly after 2014, when 2021, seven years, am I right? And now all of a sudden, you don't have any evidence, you've taken the case, the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, and you threw away the case. What that has done is that it has injured Dominican democracy, it has exalted tyranny, and it has sought to consolidate an oligarchy in Dominica that is oppressing Dominicans in way of lack of economic opportunity, abusing the judicial process, denying rule of law, all of which threaten to undermine the very fabric of our democratic tradition in Dominica, and it must not stand. Because in conclusion, when that sort of behavior was allowed to continue in Haiti, unimpeded, we now have Haitians in Dominica in the hundreds and the thousands because they cannot know peace in their own country. As we saw with the murder of the president, whatever you may think of the president of Haiti, that mm. is certainly not the way we want to see governments change in our region. We want folks to be able to have free and fair elections and for our countries to be run in a democratic fashion so we can have peace, progress and prosperity where each and every one of us can be businessmen and women owners of our own houses, owners of our land, captains of industry, not relegated to the sidelines of our country's economy as spectators to our own fate. Thank you very much, Brother Sharon. Yes, and, and thanks a lot, Gabu, for that. Uh, I, I will be going over to, um, to Arvin. Uh, Arvin is, a, is a, the young kid on the beach here, but nevertheless, I mean, he has a lot of knowledge of what transpired in Dominica over the years. Alvin, but in fact, he played an integral role in the Ministry of Tourism and in probably other ministries as well as an administrator. So he's very familiar with a lot of the things that uh, Dr. Irving Andre and Gabriel Christian spoke about. I will be going back to, to, to um, 
Dr. Vinandri a little later. We hope to take some calls after Alvin's intervention. But I mean, certainly some of the things that were mentioned by Gabriel, Christian, Alvin, some of the things like, um, you know, attempts to pass bills in the house, you know, that shut your mouth bill by Patrick Jones regime. What lessons we learned from that? But yet, we tried to pass bills in Dominica recently to legitimize bribery and treating. We withdrew them later on and said, okay, maybe we'll stop talking about it because we withdrew it. But what was the intent when we put it in there in the first place? And then, of course, you know, somebody said that Patrick John is a man who lived very humbly. But um, he never asked for $64,000 a month for him to have a lavish lifestyle for himself and his family. He didn't ask for that. He didn't want a palace on the hill. Um, of course, Patrick John did not try to legislate public officer salaries and to sideline their union to prevent them from being able to negotiate salaries for 13 years. So in terms of some of those lessons that we're talking about, you know, obviously we saw where Moise arrived at. And we don't want that to happen in the country, as Gabriel said. But are we not learning lessons from all of this? Uh, are we still going to go ahead and try to do what we're doing? We remember, Dalvin, the famous statement, look, these fellas at the Electoral Commission, they are trying to do some madness down there. They want to have electoral reform. You know, they want to clean voters, listen, all kind of thing that is going to affect the, leg the winning legacy of our leader. You can't allow that to happen. How can you expect to have free and fair elections in Dominica? We don't want to. We want to be able to bribe people and treat people and bring them in the vote. And you allow them to stop that. So everybody said, but I'm just raising those questions. Is that what they were for? Uh, the thing is that also uh, spoke about good advice and bad advice, right? And is our prime minister getting very bad advice? I mean, we see what is happening in our CBI program. We've seen the issues of people getting diplomatic passports all over the place. We have no idea who those people are. And when we ask about them in the parliament, they say, listen, this is confidential. You're not supposed to know about that. I mean, are we learning any lessons from all of those things, Alvin? And then, of course, because you're a union man, at one time you were the general secretary of the public service union. You would know that you cannot try to sideline a union and, 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 and try to legislate wages. But we have to pay a little bit of, uh, let's show a little respect and homage to our, our, our brother, Curtis Augustus, a union man who passed recently. And um, we, you might have some advice for your, for your, your colleague, um, Mr. Um, Thomas Luther, in terms of what is happening now, because it seems to me that somebody's trying to eliminate the union. It is seeming that we eliminated people from the Electoral Commission because those guys trying to create good electoral reforms. Are we trying to eliminate uh, Thomas Slater from the union? So, Alvin, I, I want to go over to you so that you could educate us on some of those things that we, you know, and I, I will go a little after Alvin. We'll, we'll open the line so we can take a few calls. But after that, I really want to go back to Dr. Andrew because there's so many of these issues I know that he would want to comment on and expand on them for us for our discussions and for that of our listeners. Let me just acknowledge our listeners on Facebook. Many of them are there already. So I'll be let me go over to you now for your contribution. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. G. Thank you, Sheridan, for um, that introduction. And let me as well just say good evening to my good friend Irvine and uh, brother Gabo and um, Sherwin, our technician, and Lambi on the console. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to be part of that discussion and to dialogue with uh, Dominicans listening. Good evening to all the Dominicans in Dominica and in the, what we refer to as the diaspora um, listening. Um, I know no matter where we are as Dominicans, we are concerned about whatever is happening in our country, whether it's the good or the bad, we are concerned as Dominicans. And um, no matter how long we may be away, um, that would not change that fact. Sheridan, I want to start whatever I'm going to say by premising on three things. Most countries have certain symbols or 
or norms or culture, whatever you want to call it. So we got a flag, we got a constitution, um, we got what is referred to as a national anthem. Every country has that. And the question I would like for us to think of tonight in terms of the Dominicans listening, what is the significance of our flag to us as Dominicans? Do we know what it represents, especially our young people? What about our constitution? How many of our young people in the schools, in the secondary schools in particular, or at the college, are familiar with the constitution? So that when our governments or whoever breach the constitution, they can say, well, or they could be informed and knowledgeable as to their rights as citizens. Let me refer to the national anthem. The national anthem titled Isle of Beauty. And it says, Isle of Beauty, Isle of Splendor. I don't know how often we listen to those words or we recite those words or we even know what's in there. Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gift so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills, and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy land, so like all fountains, giving cheer that warms the soul. Dominica, God has blessed thee with a climb benign and bright. <clears throat> Pastures green and flowers of beauty filling us, filling all with pure delight. And a people strong and healthy, full of godly reverent fear. May we ever seek to praise thee for this gift so rich and rare. Come forward. Sons and daughters of this gem beyond compare. Strive for honor. Sons and daughters, do the right. Do the right. Be firm, be fear. Toil with hearts and hands and voices. We must prosper, song the call. In which everyone rejoices. All for each and each for all. Those words were adopted in 1967, 54 years ago, well before independence. And they were words by Wilfred Oscar Morgan Pond, this is. And the music was by Lamwell McPherson Christian, relative to my good friend there, Gabriel Christian. This is our national anthem. Do those words mean anything to us? Or are they just words? As young people, do we know? Do we, do we put any meaning to those words or as Dominicans? When we say all for each and each for all, what, what does that mean anything to us? I just, well, whatever. This is our national anthem. We've seen the United States of America when the national anthem is being recited. Americans will stand. We are pin drop. It means something to us as a people. It means something. And I'm afraid we are at the point now where we ask ourselves the question, how did us, how did Dominica get to this point? And where do we go from here? How did we get to this point and where do we go from here? That's the fundamental question. You made reference to um, Grenada. October of this year, the 25th of October, will be 38 years of the U.S. invasion into Grenada. 38 years. On March 13, 1979, was when the new Jewel movement led by Morris Bishop throughout the Gary Ed 
the Grenada United Labour Party, March 1979. Look at the parallels. April, May, two months after in Dominica, Patrick John was thrown out of office. What are the parallels? Okay. In May of May 29, 2009, May 29, 2009, the Point Salen Airport was renamed the Morris Bishop International Airport. That was done on May 29, 2009, 26 years after the revolution or the invasion. And incidentally, Canada was against it, Britain was against it, Trinidad was against it, the United Nations General Assembly had a vote to 109 or 108 to 9 that condemned it. You know what I see now? I see a democracy that is hijacked and governance thrown out to the window. In any democracy, there are four fundamental pillars that will protect and drive and safeguard a democracy. One, the rule of law. Two, elections and the political process. Three, civil society, the engagement of civil society, the church, the unions, the NGOs, the business sector, and for governance. Are we surprised where we are today? In 2000, a 28-year-old young man by the name of Roosevelt Skerritt was elected and formed part of the Labour Party government, 28 years old. No experience. As my grandmother would say, not even a Shadel movie. He managed a run or anything. Okay, 28. Four years later, at the age of 32, we say, oh, give him a chance. He's a young man. He got dimples. He's bright. He's handsome. And we put in his hands um, in, in the following year, in the Appropriation Act, number five of 2005. That was one year after. We entrusted this young man that we say, give him a chance to run the country, you run the business with 275 million six hundred and sixty seven dollars two hundred and thirty nine dollars to run the business. You've been in business, Sheridan. I've been in business myself. You take a 32-year-old guy, no experience, nothing to run your $5 million, $10 million business. But we gave him $275 million and we tell him, go ahead and run the country, run the business. And in recent time, in 2019, after 17 years of inefficiency, as I said, this it's not a question of trying to call out. It's, it's a fact. After 17 years, he's now given $1.2 billion appropriation act to 2019 to run the country. So you're saying, yeah, you go ahead, run the business. And you know what, what we would say in our local palace? He has Kool-Aid the business. Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid boutique. But I like Kool-Aid. Are we surprised? We're not surprised. That's how we got to that point. Where do we go from there? As I said, would you, would you, as would J.R. Stephen and company take a 32-year-old, no experience, no training, no leadership, nothing, and tell him run the company? 5 million, 10 million, 20 million? Any one of those Dominicans building hotels in Dominica now, take 5 million, 10 million, invest in your hotel, and we'll say, hey, you 30 Go in there, run it. No experience. They have never managed anything, never run anything. And you know the other, the other part of it. That's why he's taking sixty-four thousand dollars. They came in broke. So if you have somebody who who doesn't understand what money is like and how to manage money, and I've never managed money, and you tell him, look, I'm giving you two hundred seventy-five million dollars to manage. I'm giving you one point two billion dollars to manage. What do you expect? Seriously. Seriously, what do you expect anything? You say, Well, he's young, give him a chance, he's handsome, he has dimples. So, is that what's going to drive 
the business. And we have seen what happened over the years. Take the rule of law that I referred to. You referred to the Fiscal Policy Act that he was trying to, to slip in like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. Where's the intent? As I said to an address to the trade union members a couple of years ago when I addressed, I think it was our um, 65th or 75th year as, a, as an organization. Incidentally, the CSA is 80 something years old. The CSA produced CARICOM, um, OECS, you name it, even the political parties. The CSA predates all of that. So I'm confident that the CSA will be there. They will try to do a lot of things to, to dismantle it, but it's not going nowhere, trust me. There comes a time what is called the tipping point. And every people have what is called a tipping point, and a country has a tipping point. As we speak here tonight, we see on the in the news what's happening in Cuba. We may have our own personal views about it, but this is what you call the tipping point. The tipping point took place in Grenada a couple of years ago. The tipping point took place in Dominica a couple of years ago. The tipping point took place in Haiti. It's what you call the tipping point. Go back to the rule of law. You have a Dominica State College. We know what happened at the college. There is what is called a Dominica State College Act, number four of 2002. It's an act of parliament. It's a legal piece of document. And guess what? A college was run without a board, without a bursar, without, I mean, it's like, huh? Section 31, section 31 of that piece of legislation. Um, it, it speaks somewhere um, where the, the board, 38, I'm sorry, section 38. The board shall, it didn't say me, the board shall submit to the minister within three months after the end of each academic year or within such further time as the minister may consider reasonable, a report on the activities of the college during that academic year and a development plan for the new academic year. On or before 1st October in each year, a statement of the college account audited in accordance with section 37, one of the financial year ending in such year or on or before the 31st of March in each year, it's estimates of revenue and expenditure for the college in respect of the next financial year for the approval of the minister. That's a law. They are of the law, rule of law, what hell law? You have, the, you have another piece of legislation. Act number SRNO 21 of 2012, the integrity of public, integrity in public office. You know better than I, what was the position with that piece of legislation? As he have said before, no law can allow him to do well, whatever he wants. There's no law. So, so consistently you have seen legislations just, just, just thrown. Nah, I don't do with that. Because we've taken someone, as I said, who've never been in any sort of organization or leadership or anything and put to run a country. Election, electoral reform, you guys have had repeated discussion on that. I don't want to go in there, but we have no fingerprints on that. There are at least three reports. The more recent report is from the three esteemed organizations, Commonwealth Secretariat, OAS, and CARICOM. And they all made some very fundamental recommendation what needs to be done. There's no need for a sub -iron. with all respect to a sub -iron. Recommendations are there. What we need is implementation. But again, you don't care. So throw that aside. I don't care what CARICOM say or what OES say or what um, they say or what reports say. Let's look at civil society. He went to a, a function recently in Venezuela, Alba, or wherever it was, and he referred to the NGOs as, help me, Sheridan, he referred to the NGOs as some whatever you refer to them as, destabilizing the democracy and what have you. And you know who he, 
who as as the young folks would say he big up he big up china big up venezuela big up cuba this is what he big up you refer to as an imperialist and all that kind of stuff civil society civil society right now is emasculated though this was not my days when you had ngos you had churches you had youth groups you had all those organizations that would would speak and pressure and demonstrate and protest when you had the business sector supporting initiatives that the union what initiative supporting initiative of the private um the union support initiative of the private sector those days are gone it's gone let me share with you what 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 i i i heard last just yesterday i was listening to dbs and you had there was a program on with um with um What's the manager of Cecil Joseph? And he had a guest on. I think it was, I think it was that former police officer superintendent. Remember his name, member of the UWP. And they were having this dialogue and uh, talking about the question of inciting and all of that. And the guy raised the question of the prime minister making the statement to his supporters that when you see the UWP supporters are well them, harass them, hassle them, um, torment them. If you tell them in the supermarket, if you tell them in the cemetery, if you tell them in church. And he's saying, don't you think that is coming from the prime minister is, is, is insightful? Don't you think that's what it is? I heard the prime minister said during the last election that when the UWP come, did they come to your Labour Party doorstep? Jete Glosho you. You know, it's not incited. No, guess what? Cecil is defending that. I would have at least, at least feel if you'd say, well, you know what? In the heat of things, sometimes we say stuff that on reflection, we should not have said. If he had said something like that, I could live with it. But he is defending, you know what he says? But did anybody got, did anybody get, um, um, did anybody got whatever, um, tackle anybody did anything happen defending that so that brings me to the question that i think gable said earlier about associates i don't call them associates i call them enablers and that is where we need to go now that is where this discussion must not only center on the ills of folks like prime minister scary but the enablers and especially those we know who used to stand up for truth to, to bring them out, these enablers. Because like my grandmother would always say, I had a grandmother that I learned a lot from. May her soul rest in peace. She lived 111 years old before she went to meet her maker. So I learned a lot from her. You know what she's always say? See, pani suti we pani vole. Can identify with that. So this is yeah. what I would say as an introduction now. Um, yes. Later on, I, I, I will come in on a few other areas, but I think we are at the point where we need to ask that fundamental question. How did we get to this point and where do we go from here? What do we need to do? And I'll address some issues as it relates to young people and their role in the whole political process and democracy. And Alvin, thanks a lot for, for raising all those issues. I mean, I know that... Um... Dr. Andre and um, Gabriel have a lot more to add to all of this. You've raised some of those, a lot of those issues. I don't want to start commenting on any of the issues you raised. We will comment on them as we come back after this segment. But I really, I, it, those issues you've raised, I'm sure that many of the callers, the listeners out there, they want to call in and have their say on this. So I would like to go over to Lambi before I go back to Dr. Robin Andre. I'd like to go over to Lambi. And Lambi, give the callers the numbers and give them an opportunity so that they can make their calls and have their say. Let's hear the callers, Lambi. Uh, we're not hearing you, Lambi. Go ahead. This is the Global View on Q. The numbers are 449 The Overseas Access Number is 305 Four three two nine six two four, and we are taking your calls right now. Again, those numbers are four four nine three zero 
There is someone on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Christian Columbi and Mr. G and the best and brightest Dominica ever produced. Gentlemen, greetings. Good evening. But uh, Mr. G, listen to this, right? I will go straight to the point. Let's look at our laws. As, as uh, one of your, your, your panelists have, you have rightly said that democracy, you mentioned the four main elements. And one of them is law and order. When you have a senior counsel, a senior counsel who is an officer of the court, lying to the court, and up to now, nothing, I, I, I hear nothing about it. That is a grave, 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 grave sin in my book. You understand? Because... You have to you have to set the example. The the example has the, the, the principle and the the, the 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 um the policies has to be set by by the by the leaders. If you look at parliament in parliament, when last we ever had a, a, a financial audit table before parliament, those things often happen. So it's 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 the if it's a civil society, society allowing, because even if you give a, a gentleman that don't know nothing about business to run a business, I give you $300 to go to the market. When you come back, I want the receipt. I want to know how much money you spend. I want to know if there is change. You understand? But Dominica does know we don't hold our leaders accountable. And that's what happened to Roosevelt Scary. He does whatever he wants and he gets away with it. So now we have uh, what, what I believe we deserve is a, a, a dictatorship or oligarchy or I don't know how to, how, 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 what class I would put him. You understand? Now, if parliament is the highest body of the land and they cannot uphold the laws and the constitution which they take an oath to uphold and defend, what do you expect from the, the, the statutory boards from the other departments like the... IPO and the Electoral Commission. These people, they're going to run amok with our democracy. And where do we go from there? We have to just stop it. Just, we need a reset. We just have to stop right now in our track and reset our whole demo, strengthen our democracy. Get our people involved. But I don't know, Dominica look like they're sleeping and they'll never wake up, Mr. G. Thank you. And good night, Alvin. Good, good presentation, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're not hearing you, Landy. We have another call on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, Landy. How are you? I'm fine. Do you know who is talking to you now? Mr. Louis, there are, uh, there are four other fine gentlemen listening to you and the uh, whole of Dominica and the Caribbean and the world. You need to turn up the volume a little, Landy. Are you hear me? Turn up the volume a little, Landy. Uh, yeah, I need to repeat it again, sir. Okay, he said all country is dead. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for the call. We do appreciate it. Again, the Global VMQ taking your calls right now. On the overseas line, go ahead, please. Hello, good night. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and it's based on um, a couple of comments you guys made on the panel. Um, one of those who believe that we have to right a couple of wrongs. One of, uh, one of the wrongs, biggest wrongs, is um, Patrick John. Um, most people don't know that the Dread Act was really penned by Mamo, by Mary Junior Charles, right? And when she came into power, nobody, um, she did not repeal it. And as far as I understood, you all can correct me, but as, as far as I understand, understand right now is that the Hoshimov Act is still on the books. So we have had probably one, two, three governments or different parties of 
and nobody have dealt with those laws. If it was so much of a bad law, it would have been repealed either by Mamo, BWP, and now the current Labour Party. So in order to move forward, with all the problems we have in other society, we have a couple of wrongs we have to fix. One of them is the Kalinago problem, which I will not get into right now. And the other one is Patrick John. I'm not too sure if they still don't have the, um, his mask. He's um, the flag at half mask. So we have to apologize, even though it is to, to his family or whatever, because there are a couple things that did not, in terms of the truth, they haven't come to light. But as I said, most people don't know these laws are still on the books. And if they were so bad, back then they should be bad right now. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't know if anybody would want to comment on that. Thank you, sir. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure that um, we'll get some comments on that from Dr. Andre and from, uh, from Gabriel and Christian. But Lambo, we only take a couple more calls if we can. Before you go, if you have any calls, we'll take them now. Yes. A caller, please go ahead with your call. Yeah, hi. Um, someone mentioned laws that have not have been ignored. I think there's something even more than fundamental that the problem down the road. For the last 42 years, or 41 years that we have been independent, we have yeah. pretended that the Constitution is powerless. That was the only gift that Patrick John gave us, a constitution which he received from Princess Margaret. The year was the constitution. We tore it up in June of 1979 because while the constitution was in effect, we violated it and removed Patrick John from power unconstitutionally. We tore up the constitution. For the last 42 years, we have... In fact, someone mentioned on regarding laws, the um, certain law that says they shall regarding the the um, the college, the the um, whoever shall do so and so. We have never implemented an entire chapter of our constitution, chapter ten, which says there shall be a parliamentary commissioner. And for the last forty-two years, we have pretended that that has never happened. We have, to, we have been pretending as a country so that, in effect, we have a constitution that doesn't have a country. That there is no constitution in the world that resembles what is written in the 10 chapters of Dominica's constitution. We have to go back, and as the last um, caller says, we have to go back and put 1979 straight. We can't ignore it. If you change your DNA, you are no longer who you are. And we can't pretend that we didn't we didn't tear up our constitution, or as the um, as judges um, commission said, we didn't subvert it. We subverted our constitution, and we have to be honest enough to put it right. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for that. I have to tell you that um, I appreciate the comments that we make that we're getting, and there's a lot of good questions that we will answer. But I want to go back to Lambi. So that um, take another call if you have to. Yes, yeah. call please. Go ahead with it. that call. Yes, sir. Raise your voice a little lo louder. Well, uh, a lot of call, right? I can understand. Maybe we have some sort of call. Okay, go ahead. Is being a call. And if you if you type it in my title and what I put in. Thank you. Lambi, if you um if you wanna let's see if you can go ahead and then you we can come back a little later and take some I wanna go to Dr. Andre because um the Dr. Andre so many Questions have been raised there, and I will go to um, Gabo afterwards. But many, many questions have been raised by our callers, and a lot of things were raised by Alvin as well. And I think we need to deal with those. I want to go to you, Dr. Andrew. Let us start dealing with some of those there. 
Very good questions were raised here tonight. There are a lot of comments and response we can make to them. Well, again, thank you. And let me thank your, your callers, uh, those who've made your contributions. Again, sometimes it's not a matter of whether I agree with them, but the fact that uh, they've chosen to make their contribution to be lauded. After all, this was democracy. But let me get a couple of things out of the way. The suggestion that the Dread Act was passed by Eugenia Charles is fiction. You're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. The fact of the matter is the parliamentary debates about the enactment of the Dread Act, uh, the, the debates are there for everybody to see. It is just simply not true. In fact, Eugenia asked for the right of appeal for someone convicted under the Dread Act without success. That's fiction. Second, the Dread Act is no longer a piece of legislation which governs nominations. So to suggest that it was not it, it it was not done away with, it's not quite true. Furthermore, the Hushamos bill, to the extent that there's a suggestion that's still on the books, again, with great respect, that is not quite true. Look at what the present administration tried to do with the Dominica Chronicle when the Chronicle was in its heyday in terms of opposing the government. He didn't seek to enforce any hush your mouth bill. They bought it over. They installed some fictional fellow from the United States as the so-called owner of it. And they neutralized it. They neutralized it by simply buying it over. So again, with great respect, the caller is misinformed. He might be honestly misinformed, but he's still misinformed. Now, when the second caller talked about Section 10 and the provision for a parliamentary commission, it's never instituted. He's correct, otherwise known as an ombudsman. But that is an indictment of our leader's commitment to a democracy. An ombudsman is the official who would ensure good governance on behalf of the people. Related to that is there's no Freedom of Information Act. Alvin made reference to the IPO. When, when the last chairperson of the IPO, a lawyer to boot, I think is Julian Johnson, had the audacity to bring the prime minister to account, what happened to him? I don't know if you understand sign language. Call a guillotine. What do you call that? Who, 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 who replaced him? The person who replaced him lived five steps away from a Thank you. A God fearing man. And his first act was to stop the investigation dead in his tracks. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with, my friend. We have not paid fidelity to our own constitution because the constitution has been seen to be an inconvenient document that stands in the way of absolute power. And the question is, what do the good citizens of Dominica do in face of that relentless subjugation, harassment, guillotining of the Dominica constitution? That's the fundamental question. What, what what do they do? What are they prepared to do? To maintain adherence to the Dominican Constitution, the protections enshrined in the Constitution in terms of the preservation of the rights and freedoms of everyone, including the opposition, which is part of the government. Anyway. But you know, um, Gabriel, one of the things that um, we, we, probably the, the framers of the Constitution did not anticipate is that is the possibility of having rogues and vagabonds as the leaders of our country getting elected to office. And why? Because if you look at that constitution that we speak about, there is a lot of power placed in the hands of a prime minister in Dominica, any prime minister. And I mean, we've had many prime ministers, but how many have used that power in that kind of way? In other words, the loopholes that are there in that constitution. I mean, we, we know, for example, that 
And I think Alvin mentioned the question of audit, or somebody mentioned no audit has been laid on the table of parliament for consideration. And the law requires that that is done annually. But yet, when they, I think there is a, a, a what do you call it, a, a finance committee or something in the in the parliament that is supposed to to, to, to look at the, the finances of the, of the of the country. But when the committee, I think it's headed by the leader of the opposition and with some members from both sides. When that committee asks for information, it seems as if the servants just don't give it because the politicians may have instructed them, or I don't know, not to give it. And so you hear um, leaders saying, okay, well, listen, you're talking about two point something billion dollars that's missing from the country. But wait until the financial secretary put information in your skin, you'll run. What's to that effect? You know where they're going to hide your face. But then the, the opposition leader who's in charge of that country never gets that information. So how does this work? How do you operate a country? As somebody said, if you can not put somebody in there that does not have the experience in management, I mean, and that person disregards the law. What did the law, the body of law, supposed to help you, to encourage you how to, to run, how to function, how to con conduct your affairs? Boy, you have no audit. How many years Dominic has gone without an audit laid on the table of parliament? Gabriel Christian, turn on your mic so you can help us with some of those issues. There's so many more. Well, well first of all, let me uh, just say this. Um, I, I, I uh, a moment ago, brandished the Hansard that I got my, my good brother Irving of the debate on the Dread Act in 1974. It's in my hands. That's what you call in law and in history, an original source. So this is not some hearsay document. This is the uh, recording of the proceedings that were actually taken by the stenographer contemporaneously with the proceedings in the House. But let me just say something that has to do with your question about uh, the Constitution and the way in which it has been treated or mistreated. It has to do with education. Uh, Judge Andrew and I, yes. Brother Irving, of course, is a judge, but he is a trained historian, and I. I've taken okay. up that vocation, and Brother Alvin knows well. Uh, historians are responsible for determining the authenticity of historical data, preserving mm -hmm. artifacts, and significant documents in museums, in libraries, and studying history at the intersection of society, culture, and economics, among other duties. Why are historians and history important? The inculcation of citizen values and citizenship values and civic virtue, especially the forging of national identity and instilling a sense of pride in the common past, the teaching of a nation's history contributes to the creation and strengthening of nationalism, national de identity, democracy, and rule of law. And this evening, we had a classic example of why we are struggling in Dominica. Well intended though they may be, and I commend them for calling, but they've really unmasked the problem that we face. We are beset by some abundance of fiction, mired in ignorance and inaccuracy. Number one, in 1974, the Labour Party was in power. It had a parliamentary majority. Ioli Bla had limited office. Patrick John was a premier. He was appealed to by farmers and businessmen after the killing of John Zurezek. They believed that the dreads were being, uh, were a threat to national security and the Tory strain. The Dread Act was passed, unopposed by the Freedom Party. While it is true, Ms. Charles did make comment in the debate about the fact that people who were dreads or supposedly they dreads would be denied bail and a degree of due process they all supported the Dread Act. In 1981, with the planned invasion and the arrest of Patrick John, a terrorism act was put in place and the Dread Act was repealed. So the Dread Act is no longer the law in Nomnica. It was replaced in 91, 1981, I'm sorry, with the Terrorist Act, which moved away from using dreadlocks and as a badge of a terrorist society to more clearly defined uh, uh, acts that could be considered criminal. That's number one. Number two, in 1979, despite what people may try to do, 
in their sorrow at the passing of Patrick John, which I understand and respect. The constitution was not torn up. As a matter of fact, the Committee of National Salvation of which you were part Sheridan and I attended as a president of the Dominican Federation of Students, there were two or three factions. One faction of the political left, led by people like Rosie Douglas and William Parry, a sort of revolution. There were those who were in the middle. And there was a faction led by the business class and the Dominican Freedom Party that thought we had to remain within our constitution. And that we did. Patrick John was not removed because of, 1920, of May 29th, 1979, as an overthrow, you know. What happened was, after the riot, uh, the majority of the folks retreated to the parish hall and the grounds. Shortly thereafter, on the suggestion of Rosie Douglas, the Committee of National Salvation grouping, the Dominican Liberation Movement, the churches, the National Youth Council, the Federation of Students, the Dominican Association of Industry and Commerce, I think, Sheridan, that's where you came in, comprised that organization, and ultimately through coercive measures, some stonings and so on, or persuasion, I went to talk to my uncle. I spoke to you, I spoke to, to, to O.J. Serafin, who I had a, known from childhood. Members of the Labour Party left the side of Patrick John. They denied him their vote in parliament, and they instead appointed O.J. Serafin, who brought about the change in government and Patrick John went onto the opposition bench. So it remained within the confines of our constitution, which says that the prime minister is that minister who can in fact acquire the majority vote of the elected members. So we have to have our facts straight. And by having our facts straight, then we can be better educated. The short term of bill that was planned, it was a bill. So first of all, something proposed in parliament is a bill. After it is passed, it becomes a law. It becomes a creature of statute. But the parliament never completed its sitting. The riot took place, and the parliament was adjourned. And so the bill that would have cramped trade union activism and restricted the free press, those two bills never became law. I see Alvin. Brother Alvin is another historian who was there raising his hand. So I will yield the remainder of my time to Brother Alvin. Yes, and Alvin, as, as I go to you, I mean, just to refresh your memory, I know you're going to say that because you know you have the facts. In fact, Gabriel, you're quite right. What happened is that um, O.J. Serafin, the Committee of National Salvation, agreed to approach O.J. Serafin because he still was in the parliament. He had not resigned. And people like um, Lou Corriott and Mike Douglas and all of these folks, they were still in the Labour Party. So they were persuaded now to form a government of national unity and the people who are on the Freedom Party side who were elected would give him their support. And then the president will be written to say, okay, this man has now got the majority of the support in the parliament, so he recommended him to be prime minister. And the president then was able to make him prime minister. So it was done very constitutional. In fact, when your Rosie Douglas said, we should get Patrick done out by any means, Eugenia Charles said no, by constitutional means. Absolutely. And, and Gebu could not have said it better. And that is why when I started earlier, I made the point that as citizens, as Dominicans, whether you're overseas or Dominica, you need to familiarize yourself with the Constitution. Because everything that was done was done within the framework of the Constitution. There was nothing unconstitutional. And let me also say, though, that... Um, I appreciate the callers, and it's good that the callers are, are, are making those, uh, are asking those questions so there can be clarity. Um, the United States of America, that is well over, what, 100 plus years, is still trying to be a perfect union. They're still trying to be a perfect union. As far as they consider all of that, we're a young nation. And I'm saying that even with the limitations of our constitution, admitted it, that there may be need for reform, there shouldn't be a situation where we have a government, whether it's the Freedom Party government, the Labour Party government, the UDLP government, flouting the Constitution, which is what we see happening now as far as the rule of law. Let me, let me cite another example briefly. On the eve 
of the last election, the government decided to invite the regional security system to Dominica. Now, I have a copy there of the regional security system and what they are intended to do. The signatories agree to prepare a contingency plan and to assist one another on request of national emergencies, prevention of smuggling, search and rescue, immigration control, peace protection, customs and excise control, maritime policing duties, protection of offshore installation, pollution control, national and other disasters, and threat to national security. The MOE was updated in 1992 on and on. What did we see? Same question of rule of law. Did any one of those items I mentioned there took place in Dominica? If we had an emergency, then there would have been a state of emergency passed. Yes, there was a state of emergency. But what did we see? We saw where a regional force along with the police went into a village in the early hours of the morning and tear gas citizens arbitrarily. And they did that to the village in, on two occasions, in 2015 and 2019. And then we, we sit here and we try to figure this thing out. Come on. So, so I'm saying again, take me back to my earlier question. How did we get to this point? And clearly, it is a question of having put someone in a leadership position that put power in his hands. Prime Minister, as, as Gabu rightly said, has a lot of vested power under the, the Westminster model, which we which, which he inherited. Put all that power in one individual hand. And this individual now is behaving like, I would describe maybe as a bully. Bully is not just physical. Bully can be verbal. So he says things like, you know, harass them, throw out water on them. And then, you know, what he does now, he does reverse psychology. And every time he talks, he talks about, I'm a man of God, church, and it's God who say the airport will be built, and God says do this, and God destined me, and God put me there. Playing that semantics on the minds of the people. Simply because we have, we have inherited and we put in place someone was not prepared and ready to run this country. And this is where we are today. And how do we turn that? And what do we do is the big question. Well, here's, here's what it is, Alvin. I know that um, both Kebo and um, Dr. Andre uh, have some more they want to add to this. But I, I really believe, Dr. Andre, that, you know, we, we probably have to come back here. And you see the question that Alvin is raising, where, how did we get here and where do we go from here? We need to answer that question. What it is that we need to do to take us to ourselves out of this, get back to the new dispensation, make a whole new paradigm shift. To, in other words, go back to a lot of the intersection where we went wrong. And if we made a left turn there, let's make a right turn and go in the right direction. I firmly believe that we need to look at our constitution. We have to look at it and so we have to make some real fundamental changes there. One of the things, Dr. Andre, I certainly think if we come back here to do, I want to look at the fact that you cannot have a situation where the legislative, the, the, the executive branch is also legislative branch. The, the constitution makes provisions for two, for three separate branches, but you have the same people in control of the cabinet, in control of the parliament. So whatever the cabinet says becomes law because the eyes always have it. And it seems to me that we need to look at that. And they need to, because, as I said, the constitution did not anticipate that you may have a rogue or a vacabond or some uh, whatever kind of person as, as prime minister. And there's so much power. This prime minister no longer has more power than the president of the United States in terms of the constitution of the US. Because you look at what is happening, the Democrats have a majority in the House, a majority in the Senate, and yet they cannot do things because the minority has so much power. This is what democracy is about. You know, you know, so uh, Dr. Andre, I want to go back to you briefly too, because you know, can see the time is running on, but I certainly think that we need to come back and look exclusively at recommendations for the way forward. Dr. Andre, your, your further comments. Uh, let us not make 
the constitution uh, the villain. Because in all the Eastern Caribbean islands, Jamaica, and Vincent, Barbados, certainly, Antigua, there may be some minor differences, but the basic constitutional tenets are the same. What is not the same is the extent to which the leaders are prepared to adhere to the principles set out in the constitution. You see, so the constitution is not inherently bad. Mm -hmm. But if you put someone who thinks that the constitution doesn't govern him or her, then the constitution becomes valueless. The simple question is, is to what extent should the Dominican people choose to ensure that the rule of law prevails in their island? that getting a turkey at Christmas or some handouts in the middle of the night is not enough of a price to pay for the destruction of one's constitution. The constitution should have more meaning, more value. Dominica has to mean something. That septile, to use a Shakespearean expression, the greenery, the environment, our writers are more advanced than our politicians in terms of the preservation of our environment. Read, as I said, some of the poems written by some of our writers. Read a novel by uh, Christian Simelda, who's adopted Dominica as their own. Read, as I said, the works of a number of contemporary Dominican poems. I don't want to call other names for fear of excluding others. But to the extent that you value this legacy, and Bernard Wiltshire speaks eloquently about this every day, to the, expense that, to the extent that you place any value on it, then it must touch your very core to see that constitution being eroded to an extent where your legacy is being squandered, given away, given away for God's sake. Uh, you have persons who purchase passports who's never set in Dominica, whose children and children and children and grandchildren can become Dominican citizens, while you have persons who are connected to your island, who are given every kind of impediment to get a renewal of their passport. And it's no big deal because we say, okay, oh, well, if it happened to Father Coffee, as long as it doesn't happen to me. Father Coffee can say 10 novenas and be fine. As long as it doesn't happen to me. If that is the value you place on your passport and your sense of belonging, your rootedness, your connectedness, then you're in deep trouble. Then the problem is with you, not with the Constitution, because you are prepared to sell it, as we oftentimes say, for a mess of potage. Give it away. Flea market, garage sale. You know, you have these folks coming in. Look at who's made the commissions on the sale of Dominican passport. And you have these fellas talking about investors. Investors who come to Dominica broke, but leave Dominica with 30 million pieces of silver. These are the investors that we should be, we should be thinking. Are you crazy? If that is all we are thinking, then we are doomed. If you're interested in Greek mythology, you would read about the myth of Sisyphus, this poor fellow who was condemned to rolling up a stone up the hill. But every time he succeeds, the stone rolls right back down. Is that a metaphor for our citizenship, the value we place on our citizenship in Dominica, where Tom, Dick, and Harry can come and insult you, take your possessions, your resources, whether they're from France or Guadeloupe, whether they're from China, insult your business, your businessmen. Don't give them back a refund after selling them defective goods because they believe they have the protection of the political directory. If that is what we are satisfied for, then why are we talking about constitution? We have to talk about ourselves. What values do we bring to the table if we bring any values at all? 
And if we don't value these things, then quite frankly, we don't deserve to have that heritage or that legacy. That's how I feel. Um, I want to go to um, Gabriel Christian, but Lambie, just to let you know that um, we will take a couple more calls if the call if there's calls coming in. So stand by, interrupt us if you have the last few minutes that we have, and we will take a couple of calls from the callers. So you you will you know anytime the calls come in, just you you make us a signal. We'll take them. So Gabriel, I want to go over to you because I know that you two have a lot more that you wanted to add to all of this. And unmute your mic, Gabriel, so we can hear you. Uh, Brother Sheridan, I just want to say that um, all of us as a country, all of us as a people, as a nationality. Can we take a call, Gimbo, before you go yes, on? Please. I know there's people out there who want to contribute. Paula, please go ahead. Uh, please. Yes. yes, hi, it's me again. I have to call back because I need to correct something that Gabriel said and something that Sheridan said. And Gabriel, this is Dr. Lequen speaking, so you know who you're talking to. There is nothing in the Constitution about a commission, a committee of national salvation. So anything that was done in 79 under the auspices of the CNS was unconstitutional. Let's get that straight. Number two, even the very meeting that was called, the emergency meeting at which OJ was made interim prime minister, was against the rules of the House. Because an emergency me meeting can only be called by the speaker, and the speaker had resigned. Nobody who had the right to call that meeting into session. And I want to move on. Um, Sheldon says, and he says it often, that there's a lot of power given to the prime minister, and that the, the um, founders did not envision rogues and vagabonds being in parliament. Of course they did because they knew that they were rogue and vagabonds among themselves. If I can read, as Dr. Um, Irving said, the people have a right to elect people in and out. But there's something about the Constitution that people seem to forget. The Constitution says that the president of the country has the right to call in the prime minister at any time to ask him to give account of what's happening in the country. And secondly, the Constitution also says that where the president has to act by the advice of anyone, he is not obligated to follow that advice. So the president serves as a check against the prime minister. Our problem is that we have a president who maybe doesn't understand his job. But the Constitution cannot be blamed for what's happening in the country. And I'm glad that, that Dr. Andrew said that. The Constitution gives power, which we must use discreetly. And if we want to use it badly, that's up to us. But we can't blame the Constitution. And we must not try to do that history. What happened in 1979 was not within the Constitution. No one can claim that and have a straight face. Thank you. And thanks a lot for that. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Andre, did you, since your name was mentioned, did you want to, to respond to that before we go back? I, 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 I can respond uh, to that. I, I, I was there, Mr. Lequin was there, and Mr. Lequin is absolutely wrong. The Speaker of the House in 1979 was pushing Waldron. I believe he just died within the past year or just most recently. Okay? The reality is De Gazor was the one who fled the country. And he was replaced with Sir Louis Kuzlati, who had been the former governor. Well, what is missing and what he fails to understand is nothing in law or in the Constitution precludes a citizenry from gathering under the auspices of any banner. So while the CNS was meeting and cobbling things together, the fact is it was the elected members of parliament who retained the autonomy to cast their vote from whomsoever the commission or the, 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 the Committee for National Salvation may have recommended. So if, for instance, the commission or the committee said, Irvin Andre, who was then at UE, I believe, Mona, Irvin Andre is not an elected member. Dr. Lequent or Attorney Lequent or Professor Lequent would have been correct. If they had said Sheridan Gregoire, Sheridan Gregoire was not an elected member, or Alvin uh, 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 Thomas or Gabriel Christian, none of us were elected members, then you'd have had a revolutionary government and you'd have had the constitution indeed torn to pieces. So the committee existed, but it did not vote. 
it voted within the confines of the committee. They came to a consensus, I would think is what happened. However, the voting was by elected members who then appointed folks as senators like Arthur and Martin and Pierre Charles who were not elected. So that's what happened. So the uh, a very important note came to me by a very important Dominican who talked about Charles Sarven and Tony Asifan talked about the cool wash brigade. Stones were thrown. There was a riot. And the Labour Party parliamentarians that we persuaded to change course were responding to public pressure, which is what parliamentarians have to do. They have to respond to the sentiments of the electors, even after an election. And they thought it was important to come to an accommodation and change the prime minister and elect another one from the Labour Party, mind you, not from the Freedom Party, from the Labour Party, replace that one because he had shown himself incapable of maintaining social cohesion and social peace. And then there was an election in 1980 that the Freedom Party won and Eugenia Charles became prime minister that Patrick John lost. So that is the real history. And let's not confuse the role of the commission, uh, the committee rather of national salvation with the decision, the autonomous decision where maybe it may have been persuaded by coercive force in the streets. We had an uprising, and justifiably so because Patrick John was acting in a manner despotic and contrary to good order. So that is dealt with. And Tony Asafan had no involvement. In fact, what Tony Asafan has done is to destroy our constitution by allowing for, for the continuation of a regime that has broken the law on several occasions, splits itself above the law. I will conclude by saying that as Irving said, we have to know our history. We have to be accurate in writing that history, not respond to emotion and sympathy and and bias, we also have to educate ourselves in civic matters, have a law day, read our constitution, have, have citizens be possessed of that constitution so they can familiarize themselves with it. Finally, Sheridan, you're correct, we need a constitutional convention because right now Westminster has failed us. The same executive authority, the government, is the majority party in parliament, the legislative branch, so we have a consolidation of power between the executive and the legislative branches that is authoritarian. And that same executive has its thumb on the judiciary, including the director of public prosecutions. And that is why our democracy right now is in the tomb because you have a consolidation of power. You do not have the separation of powers with one balancing out the other. Let me, let me just say something, Alvin, just before you. Here's what I would say is this. Uh, Gabo mentioned, and I, I want to appreciate Mr. Le Quen because he mentioned his name, his contribution. I really appreciate his contribution. Gabo did mention, of course, the fact that public pressure was brought. And we can see some signs these days that public pressure is being brought, but this prime minister is handling it somewhat differently. Every time public pressure comes, he gives in to give the impression as, oh, yeah, I'm not a guy who's going to. Um, so the, the, the bus drivers came, he gave in. The uh, people at the college came, he gave in. The people in West, came, he gave in. The public. But then he goes back and says something else after. Well, when the, the attempt was made to pass bribery and treating in parliament, he, the public pressure came, he gave in. But here's the thing that what happened at that time, there was a lot of public pressure. A lot of public pressure. And nowadays, you don't have as much public pressure. I don't know whether it, it looks like things are going to develop to that level of public pressure. But there was so much public pressure that what happened is that Patrick John, because of the elected members of the Labour Party that were still there, he lost the support of the majority of elected members of the parliament. So with the Labour Party persons like O.J. Seraphine and Corinne, those guys, who were still there, and with the addition of the other Freedom Party officials who had been elected, they then, O.J. Serafin then was given the majority support, and so the president was able to appoint him as prime minister because he now commanded the majority, supported the majority of elected members of the parliament. So I thought I would see that, Alvin, uh, before yeah. you come in. I, 
I just want to briefly say, though, that, um, and I agree with the comments that Irving made earlier, but let us, let us, for the benefit of the caller, let us look at the persons who've been appointed presidents before. Vernon Shaw, check the cabinet. Signoret, um, Crispin Sorrento, Liverpool. Let's go ahead, let's call the names. And this current president is the only president that came from a minister in a party in office to president. So the point that David is making is so fundamental. I mean, this president, because he speaks about the president um, as a buff and exact, but this is the first and only president who came as a sitting minister and appointed president. None before that. Look at how the appointment of speakers of the parliament has been undertaken in the past, even the most recent one. It takes us back to the whole question of the fundamental of rule and law and the various processes that form the democracy, rule and law, election political process, civil society, governance. And that's what happened, as I said, when you put somebody in charge who is not able to control the thing. Patrick John, when Patrick John became prime minister, Patrick John prior to that was the general secretary of a powerful union, you know, wow. Ran as mayor, taught at the St. Mary's Academy, mature, been involved. LeBlanc, Eugenia, Edison James, going to region, Mia, Manley, Mitchell, Chastney, Dr. Kenny. I mean, name it. These are folks who have been involved and, and understand how to run something. You run the country. Which one of them in Dominica, as I said, would take their $10 million business and hand it to you and say, run it for me? And you take a $1.2 billion economy and say, give it to this chapter run. Clearly, that's where we are. And I'm uh, saying, like Sheridan said, we need to change course. And, and we need to find a way to engage young people as much as possible in this dialogue. I'm not sure what mechanism, maybe something we will have to discuss again. And then also to call out the enablers, the folks who have been enabling that kind of behavior. Because in the 70s, we were, not in, we were, we were protesting those type of situations. So... I think that we all can contribute towards the solutions. I, I, <laughs> there's no, there's nothing that persuades me to think that us around the table and people who are listening out there cannot come up with recommendations that will help us to change course and put us on the right track. I mean, let's face it. And kids did some things, and Lucia did something. You know, Barbados did something. They all have done something, and look at where they are now compared to where they were 20, 30 years ago when we were ahead of many of them. Obviously, they must have done something right, right? So I think that we can do some things that are right, and I would like us to come back here. And I have some ideas myself, and I'm sure we all have. We can put some things on the table, from our constitution down to our policies and down to our strategies and down to our whatever it is that we do in terms of using our natural resources to make sure that we get the right place. And then, of course, to put good governance in place. And, but, I, you know, gentlemen, the time is our enemy right now. And um, it's about time for us to make our closing remarks, but I, I do hope that we can come back here again and talk about the solutions because we cannot leave the people, we cannot come up and talk about all the problems, all the issues, and then to come back and talk solutions. And I know that we can talk solutions. We have talked solutions on this program before. We can talk about it again. And I wanted to go to um, Gabriel first for your closing remarks, Gabriel. Your, your mic is muted. Unmute your mic. Thanks again, Brother Sheridan and Brother Lambie on the controls, and Brother Norris, Brother Irving, Brother Alvin. It's an honor and privilege for me to be here this evening. First, I've had this opportunity to try to bring some sense of, of direction. Uh, but it's obvious to me that we need a lot more civic education. In 1215, King John, uh, facing a problem with the Lords in England, passed the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is seen as the basis for 
most Western rule of law systems. Because what it did was it put order in the relationship between the king and the lords to the degree that the king, in that instance, accepted that he was not above the law. The king is subject to the law as much as the commoner is, an elementary principle. In Dominica today, we see a consolidation of the executive, the judicial branch, and the, the legislative branch. We see a decimation of civil society organizations. We see bias in policing. We see total disregard with regard to the integrity in public office commission. As Brother Alvin rightly said, we see a... The point that Brother Alvin made was that he was talking about a culture that had been established that the position of president had been held in the past by distinguished civil servants who were not, who were not known to be rabid partisans. Charles Severin is a rabid partisan. He is someone who does not represent the state in an unbiased and objective way. He has disgraced his office. He has disgraced the country. He has presided over the decimation of our democracy. And enablers like Tony Astefan and Parry Bellot and Rupert Sorendo are also disgraceful because they are men and women, they are men who should know better. But they still sit down and allow for these charade to continue. So education is important, a constitutional assembly, so that we can reform the Westminster system that has failed us, so we can create independent branches of, of power that are interdependent in a sense, but in one way or the other, unable to uh, totally sub sub submerge the other, the independent judiciary will do us well. The independent legislative branch will do us well. The independent executive branch will do us well. But more importantly, we need, we need, so 1215 to 2021, that's 806 years. So that's a long culture that folks in Britain and so on, and they're still struggling with different issues. So we need to create a culture in Omnica that is learned, where we have the facts right, not in the books that we've written on issues such as May 29th are in the public uh, uh, domain and we have the schools. They're being used in the United States and other countries, not in Dominica. It's not a shame. And then we have people, therefore, who are rather less because the written record is not accessible to them. And the public library where you could go and get records. What's the status of the public library, Brother Sheridan? Can you tell me? I rest my case. You don't have to answer that question. No, and um, as I go to, to Alvin, um, I, I just wanted to say this, you know, that Alvin, as you make your closing remarks, I mean, we, we can conclude, in fact, that the change was brought about from Patrick John to O.J. Seraphine, because O.J. Seraphine then command the majority among the elected members. But let us face it, Alvin, that did not come about by ordinary means not by a normal elect. That came about because a lot of civil disobedience. That came about because the, the, the general secretary of the public service union said, the port will not work, the hospital will not work, nothing is going to work, and I want 121% increase, and everybody came out for that. And every, a lot of stones were thrown, and presidents had to run a little bit country, people's garages, or fire bombed or whatever it was. This does not come from ordinary election campaigns. It came from, that was the background, right? That was the environment in which that happened. I just want to make that point for the record. But I'll give you a closing remarks. Yeah. yeah, well, Sheridan, um, let me thank you for the opportunity, as I said, to dialogue with our fellow Dominicans um, in Dominican overseas. And always a pleasure, Irvine and Gabo, um, to be a part of that discussion with you guys, Lambi and Sherwin. Thank you. Um, uh, Gable made mention of the public library. The, the prime minister is getting $64,000 a month to pay or whatever or keep his residence. Over a 12-month period, that would equate somewhere in the region of almost a million dollars, $768,000. That would, but that is enough money to restore the public library and set up the library, put a roof, put some computers in there, um, digital. And, and and restore the building to what it should be and have it as a resource where young people can go in and learn about the constitution, learn about other things. But no, that's not a priority. Again, it's a question of management, as I said. Democracy comes from the Greek word demo, demos, demos, the Greek word demos, meaning people. 
And in any true democracy, it is the people who hold sovereign power over legislature and government. So we we at this juncture now, as I said, where civil society supposed to get back to what it was. The business sector need to make some some not necessarily to 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 criticize, but state a position as to how they see the country moving forward. They are hurting. We know they are hurting. We see a, a business we didn't mention that night. We see we see a business of almost forty years we have shot in its doors. What does that tell us? We saw a Ross University forty years, almost the age of our independence, disappear. What does that tell us? And it's like no big deal. Oh, Ross go, that's okay. We'll get something else. Oh, we have go, that's okay. So clearly, something is wrong. Something is dramatically wrong. And we we got to get in some shape or form, get business to speak as used to have before. The church is a little too quiet. The church needs to speak on social issues that affect a people in a country. Church is too quiet. The trade unions need to be a little more, more, more vocal. We mentioned Curtis Augustus, a stalwart and pioneer who have served the unions in Dominican, in the region, and even internationally. Condolences to his family and 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 and, and friends. They need to be more vocal. These enablers who enable that kind of behavior need to be called out. We need to get civil society back engaged. Because as we said earlier at the start of this discussion, there are parallels. We had a Grenada situation. We saw what happened in Haiti. And I'm not just talking specifically to the assassination of the president, but the fact that people get to that tipping point. We see what is taking place now in Cuba. Did any of us ever imagine that we'd be seeing on television what's taking place in Cuba now and even extending in Miami where you have a big Cuban population? You get to that tipping point. And I'm saying we don't, we don't have to wait to get to that tipping point. Those of us who still possess that moral compass within us as a people need to engage and need to involve. And that is why I started off by, by referring us to our national anthem. The words in here are so powerful. Does it mean anything to us as a people? Does it, does it say anything to us? So I will close by just saying that the dialogue has to continue. The work has to continue. Um, it has just started. And, and, and all of us has a role to play. Those of us in Dominica, those of us outside of Dominica. And I just want to thank again, thank you and, and the rest of the folks for the opportunity to be able to participate in, in this discussion tonight. Yep, and, and thanks a lot, Alvin. Um, as I go to Dr. Andrew, I just want to remind him that when we started the program this evening, I heard a song by one of our famous local Calypsonians. Kudos to him. I think it is Hixie. Hixie, yeah. And that's all of the things that he saw in the rearview mirror that he sees now and that he sees coming in the future. Dr. Andrew, your, your, your closing remarks? Well, let me commend you again uh, for showing us such great insight in taking a song which speaks to us in a very relevant fashion. Uh, let me thank and commend both Gabriel and uh, Alvin for their wonderful presentation. I will probably um, continue where Alvin left off democracy as is commonly known is government for the people by the people of the people but democracy basically if you think of it in a profound fashion is perhaps an extension of the biblical admonition that you are your brother's keeper that what you do to the list of our brothers that you do unto me and I think we have to reflect, we as Dominicans, we have to reflect on those, those proofs which are found, I believe, in the Bible. 
and we have to adopt a perspective which transcends our own narrow self-interest. Why is that significant? One of our presenters talked about, made reference, for example, to bus drivers took to the street. They were promised a few dollars and they stopped protesting. Truck drivers from Wesley is the same thing. The public service threatened to take the streets because of impending legislation. The political directorate disavowed its intention to enact that legislation and they went meekly back to their desks. So what has happened is that the political directorate has exploited the narrow mindedness of the various sectors of the society. They have exploited the fact that there is no consensus building. There is no unanimity of vision or purpose that we are all in this thing together. That a promise of a few contracts does not solve the fundamental problem, the deprivation of rights, the fact that our resources are being sold and given away, the fact that the private business sector is being decimated, and it is even more decimated by legislation which promises higher wages. What is a promise of higher wages if your employer has to shut down the entity which is in the best position to pay higher wages is the government. Those who have $1.2 billion, according to Zampoli, hidden in foreign accounts and yet what the political directorate is promising is an increase. They want to limit in an increase to one or two percent over 12 years. But they are forcing employers who have been beaten into the ground because of the unfair competition from those who may not even be paying taxes or duties to pay these higher wages with the result that many of these employees of local businesses will find themselves out of a job. There's no unanimity of vision or purpose. We're all in this thing together. It's not because a piece of legislation is withdrawn that you should go back to your cage. There has to be a holistic view of where you're at. And this is what we have to develop. This is what our leaders have to develop. That you are in this thing together. And it's not because you're doing a little better than another sector that you should be content and sing your hallelujah. Because as Bob Marley says, frankly, when the rain falls and it will fall, it will not only fall on your house, it will fall on others, especially those who believe that they are in somewhat of a higher bracket. They're in a better financial position. We have to break down those barriers, whether it's class, whether it's caste, whether it's education, whether it's feelings of superiority. We have to break down those barriers and realize that whether you like it or not, we are all in this thing together. If you don't have that collective vision, you will be picked up, picked off, sector by sector. Just a matter of when, but sector by sector, you'll be picked up. Because that's the pattern. Where is the vision? That's what we have to do, develop a collective vision, a collective consensus that we are in this thing together. We are fighting arms in arms to protect and preserve our way of life, to ensure democracy, to ensure that everyone can earn an honest living, can provide for their families, send their children to school, take a holiday like Mr. G. We are all in this thing together. Let us not be divided by notions of superiority based on economics, based on complexion, based on the manner of in which you command the English language, based on religion, 
we have to break down those barriers to build a successful Dominica. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. Andre, certainly I think um, history has taught us and history has taught other people in the region that unity of purpose gets results. When people are united with one mindset to achieve a certain goal and they move forward together without relenting. Because what I think you're saying is, 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 is correct. Every time something happens, they get a little something, they retreat. Every time something happens to another sector, they get a little something, they retreat. It means that they, there's no unity, overall unity, a holistic purpose. And that is what the problem is. But we've seen it happen in Dominica before. And that is what brought about the change in 1979. All the sectors got together. And they said, you know something, we need a new dispensation. And they got it. So I'm saying that, gentlemen, that uh, I'm really grateful to all of the contributions that we made here tonight by uh, our panelists, you distinguished gentlemen here, but also by the callers. And also by many other people who are on Facebook who are making their comments. And by some of the people who didn't get to call, but I know that they would have liked to have had a chance to call. And they had great, I'm sure they had great contributions to make. But really, I want to thank Alvin and uh, Gabo and, and Dr. Andre and Lambi and Sherwin. I think we had a, a, a good discussion here tonight, but I think, I believe we have an obligation to come back and look at the way forward. Because I think um, we need really some direction in Dominica and people are thirsty for it. I can see what is happening there now is people are taking initiatives on their own, but then what is happening they, after they take it, they're retreating and they're not getting the long-term solutions in place. And that is what you need. You need to have the long-term solutions in place. Strategy. You must have a strategy and you have to go forward with a strategy and to have a new dispensation. You cannot come back and have the same old, same old just because you got a little something and then you retreated and then next year or tomorrow, next month, you still have the same problems. So you see, so gentlemen, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and I want to thank our listeners and our callers and Lambie and Sherwin and thank you so much. But we hope to come back again and have another little get together see if we can make some recommendations about the way forward out of what the mess that we're in now i think it's a mess that we're in we need to get out of it so thank you so much and i hope we all have a great evening the rest of the evening what's left of it thank pleasure you. is mine pleasure thank is mine you. thank you to the listeners all right good night everyone thank, good thank night. you good night pleasure